we live in this time where we can not only bring experts into our classrooms, but we can share our expertise with the world. And there's just so many opportunities that didn't exist when I was a kid. The thought of talking to authors uh, when I was a kid was near impossible. You get maybe send a letter and maybe six months, you know, to a year, you might receive something back if you were lucky. And now I'm watching students in schools connect with authors real time to have conversations about what they wrote. You know, if you want to know something about a book, who better to ask than the person who wrote it? And one of the things I love about the books that I've written, having that opportunity is I have conversations. I ask people what they learn from that process. And I think that that focus on bringing experts into our classroom is so, so powerful. But we need to also think about sharing our expertise with the world. And I'm not only talking about teachers and, and, and educators, administrators, but I do think that's really important. Some of the best ideas I've ever had for what we do in schools, what we do in classrooms is just connecting with teachers I did not have access to. And the, the video, obvious to you, amazing to others, and you can see that in the link of the show notes here uh, by Derek Sivers, really talks about some of those things that you do in your classroom that are just normal um, are totally amazing uh, to somebody else that they're just second nature to you, but to somebody else, they're an idea they never thought of. And so I really appreciated being able to connect with educators in a way that I couldn't when I first started teaching in 1999. The other thing we do have to focus on is how do we do the same thing for our students? That when our students share their expertise with the world, not only does the world benefit from the learning from those students, but obviously the kids have a better understanding of that. They, they, they're, they, if you have to teach a concept to the entire world, you're gonna know it so much better. And when I was talking to Grayson McKinney and Zach Rondo on this podcast, and they have a new book out called The Expert Effect, they talked about some ways they do this in their classroom, but they also talk about how they got to that point. Because a lot of times we see these people doing these really incredible things in classrooms, and they're so far ahead of us, and they're so doing things that we couldn't even imagine. But they were at a place where they didn't know what they were doing. They were figuring things out. And they talk about that. And I asked them, like, what was your first step? How do you get to that point? And it might not be something that you need. Maybe you're at a different space. Maybe you're even further than what they're doing if you're listening to this podcast. I don't know. But you do work with other people. And it might give you some ideas on how can you help people take those steps. Because as you build confidence and competence along that road, things tend to open up. And we start to you know, be more comfortable taking some risks, trying some different things. So it was a really great conversation. I love talking to these guys. They teach together. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm pumped to have uh, Grace McKinney, and Zach Rondo joining me, and they're both currently teachers at the same school, and they just wrote the book, uh, The Expert Effect, and we'll talk about that in the podcast. And I actually uh, met these two guys uh, in Troy, Michigan. I was at their school district. Maybe we'll talk about that, right? Because basically, probably before then, you were just, you know, all of a sudden, I just inspired you, and that was it, right? Probably that. I'm just kidding. We were probably. lost in the wilderness. Yeah, right. And so, you know, <laughs> like it's awesome. Uh, it's awesome to connect with you uh, over time. And uh, they're actually from uh, Troy, Michigan is in the Detroit area, right? And I don't know if I told you yeah. this story. Okay. So small town Canada kid. I have this like really big connection, like I guess a love for Detroit. And, and why would a kid in western canada because like you know windsor is literally across the street from you right from detroit yes and i actually didn't even know that to be honest with you it, I, it was <laughs> only it was only when i was speaking i was in windsor for something and i said oh i'm gonna buffalo for a football game and they're like why wouldn't you go to detroit and i'm like well how far is detroit and they're like five minutes I'm like really i didn't know and i'm like yeah and they're like it's there right so my my connection um with detroit i'm gonna see we're gonna see how old i am and like how dated i am on this was uh, growing up in small town Canada, we had, uh, and you probably get it. Do you have CBC? Do you get CBC? You yeah, know what oh CBC yeah. is? Right? Hockey Night in Canada. Hockey Night in like Canada, it. right? <laughs> so we had two channels, CBC and CTV. So Can one's Canadian Television, one's Canadian Broadcast Corporation. And then we got cable, okay? And for some reason, 
the only cable channels we got were all Detroit channels in Western Canada. <laughs> so like everything was, it was awesome because everything was on early for us, right? Cause it's playing Eastern time and we're like two hours ahead. And, uh, I am like, so WDIV in Detroit, do you know this? Right. Yeah. Does yep. it still exist? Like it's still a thing. Yeah. I think it's NBC and, uh, Carmen Harlan, I think just retired, right? Carmen Harlan was there for years and, uh, Bernie's bloopers, Bernie Smilovitz was like oh, my yeah. guy as a kid. Do you, do you know who I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Right. So like, about. so like I know the song stand up and tell them you're from Detroit stand up. So I like, remember like this, I grew up with this. Right. So it was just weird. And I remember going there. I'm like, this is the home of like Bernie Smilovitz and Carmen Harlan. <laughs> And I was just, I just love that. It was, it was something. So, uh, that's my little Detroit story because I think it's just fascinating. Like why in Humboldt, Saskatchewan on Western Canada, did we get Detroit channels? Right. (laughs) It was just a weird thing, but that's what we did. So I I grew up, you know, uh, watching the the Red Wings and, you know, I I wasn't a fan of the Pistons, but I heard about them all the time because I was a Lakers fan and Pistons have broken our hearts several times. Uh, <laughs> the bad boys. Yeah, the, the bad, bad boys, boys of Detroit. Uh, yeah, but amazing, amazing uh, city, amazing sports city, and uh, WDIV in Detroit. It's my favorite TV channel of all time. I got a special affinity for that. So, yeah, 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 that's right. You, oh, I missed the cue. I missed it. I missed, I think I missed the, there we go. Shout out WDIV in Detroit. But it's awesome to have you guys here. Um, and so, uh, Zach, we'll actually get you to start. If you can just introduce yourself and then uh, tell us a little bit about your education journey. And then, Grayson, if you could do the same thing. Yeah, my name is Zach Rondo. I teach fourth grade in Troy School District, uh, which is about 25 minutes north of Detroit. Um, I've been a teacher for eight years. I've been teaching, I taught third grade for two years, and the other six years have been in fourth grade. Um, I also, just for the past year, I've been teaching a college course for Central Michigan University uh, called Innovative Uses of Technology. So working through that now. Um, and that's, that's my education journey. Yeah, and I'm a fifth grade teacher in the same school uh, at Costello Elementary in Troy. Um, and I came to teach fifth grade in a little bit different route. I, I started out teaching um, fifth and sixth grade multi-age. And then I helped uh, my, my, the first district where I was working build their elementary Spanish program because yeah. I had double majored in elementary ed and Spanish ed. And so I taught K through six Spanish and then um, moved to teach in Troy. And I've taught in fourth and fifth grade there since. So. And so, but you're on the same staff right now, correct? And, and, uh, yeah. and Grayson, you teach grade five, Zach, you teach grade four. So I got to yeah. ask this, like Grayson, do you get... Zach's kids sometimes you're like Maybe. Zach did not <laughs> Zach just totally bailed this year like does that well, if we're gonna three, find out it's gonna be this you know it's gonna be the 2021 20, school year okay. right see so what yeah three three things usually happen to us because for for many years we were the only two right. male teachers on the staff so I would be Mr. Rondo and he would be Mr. McKinney <laughs> as like kindergartners were passing us in the hallway right, right. Uh, the other thing that happens is sometimes we dress alike we without right. planning on it we wear like the same <laughs> shirt same color pants and that's embarrassing uh but then the third thing yeah when i get zach's kids coming up into fifth grade it's actually a really good fit um because you know if it worked well for them in fourth grade right. what i do in fifth grade it's going to be good too um and a lot of a lot of our philosophy um we found out after you know about one or two years of like getting to know each other that we had a lot in common mm-hmm. and so it was actually pretty cool that um we had a uh, an idea one year we were the only two fourth grade um sections at our school our school was built in like the 90s when um uh like flexible learning environments right. were a big thing right. so we had these walls that you can actually remove uh from between the classrooms and we said hey what if we opened up the wall and like created this uh super class and our principal was like yes and here's the model um, she had visited a school in right. missouri um that you know had a co-teaching model and just like awesome, uh, awesome results could come from that. So we opened up the wall. We had 56 uh, fourth graders, right. two co-teachers, and it sounds a little bit crazy, but um, I think working together, like side by side, it was the most meaningful collaboration that um, I had ever experienced as a teacher. Because on a daily basis, we were seeing each other teach. We were giving each other feedback. We we're saying, "Wow, that did not work. <laughs> right. uh, we need to figure out a way to manage that transition," or you know work on this in a different way. And so 
um, you know, it wasn't the kind of like collaboration where you're just like checking in and saying like, Hey, what chapter are you on? Right. It was like, um, our, our principal called it a marriage and Zach was like, well, it's more like a, you know, college roommate right. cool right. thing, right. but <laughs> so it was, it was a cool experience. So, okay. So I've actually worked in that situation, um, both as a teacher and not an administrator, but like a tech lead. And mm -hmm. I've seen, okay. So I've seen the really great collaborative, uh, space and really kind of changing the way that we look at teaching and learning. But I've also seen, Hey, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to like, just kind of do my marking in the back and you're going to lecture 50 kids. Right. I've seen that yeah, too. Yeah. Right. And am mm -hmm. I, or, like, am I crazy saying this? Like, or is this just in Canada, this happened and never would happen in the United States. Right. Like, so like how, what is, you know, obviously when you have, cause you're having double the kids, you're having double the space. Um, what are some of the things that you see as necessary for you to truly take advantage of it, not to do a traditional model with more kids in a bigger space? Like what, what, what would be yeah. an important, what would be important elements of how you work together? Well, I think the first thing to say about that is you, I don't think you could open a school and just throw two random mm -hmm. teachers together and say you're partnered for this. I think it takes um, two people that are similar in philosophies, but have enough differences where it's not two of the exact same people um, in a room, but it takes, you know, it gives, it gave students the whole year a unique perspective. And the way, the most apparent thing that was right away is the direct instruction model had, when we mm -hmm. thought about that, it had to be mini lessons, keeping 56 kids' attentions mm -hmm. right. uh, for more than seven, eight <laughs> minutes, like, Right. It was not happening. So it was a lot of like coming together, um, teaching a direct instruction mini lesson. And then when we broke apart, taking uh, small groups to different parts of the room or kids working right. in groups and coaching or us walking around and coaching. So it was kind of like just flip the traditional model. And it was a lot of um, small direct instruction and then like coaching and um, small group work. So I think, okay, Zach, I think you make a really good point. And I, it, it's like something, you know, maybe I, I didn't even think of when I asked the question, but I think it kind of hit me in the head when you talked about this, because a lot of times I've watched uh, administrators blame the teachers for it not working, but you can't just say, hey, go t together and just do awesome yeah. stuff, right? There has to be some thought yeah. in like, mm -hmm. how are we getting these people to connect? Like, what's the, um, like, what's some of the training that we have to do to kind of see a different model? Because it's, it's really like... um uh, you go, it's, it's super easy to close those doors and make your classrooms the same again. Right. Uh, yeah. I have seen, uh, flexible learning spaces or, you know, like they do all these like cool furniture and like, it's all this other stuff. And then eventually, and it's kind of spaced out and that's kind of how they have the vision for it. And then it's eventually it's couches and beanbag chairs in rows, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you just, you just gave them different furniture, but you didn't really get their input in the process. Uh, you didn't really talk about like what this could look like. And one of the things that we did in our school, um, or one of the schools I worked with, uh, we had a computer lab and uh, the principal, I was like the, the uh, division principal of innovative teaching and learning. So a lot of people would come to me like, you know, with technology stuff. Um, but it was more about technology is really kind of rethinking teaching and learning. And I remember the principal coming to me and saying, hey, we, we are, um, we need, we're going to get new computers because like these computers are old and it's like there was a three or five year cycle, whatever it was. So what computers would you get? Like what desktop computer? I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get desktops. What I would do is I would gut this room and I would make it like a Starbucks lounge and I would get laptops, but have flexible seating in the space and and uh you know and so you could do technology stuff in here but you can do art you can do you know uh writing you can do whatever you need to do and the reasoning behind that was we didn't need a we didn't need desktops they weren't doing like you know autocad or anything like that this is like mm -hmm. middle school uh and uh, you know they could have on those probably in the laptops they got but instead of like going into just replacing all the teachers desks in that teacher's classroom that they might have te taught for like 25, 30 years. It's like, hey, do you want to try something different? Here's a room 
so you can kind of mm-hmm. test this out and see what's like and then the teachers would kind of have like a little test run and then they go oh like i would love my room to be yeah. that way mm-hmm. and we'd be like you know what? Weirdly enough, we put away some money for furniture, right? So we gave people that experience to kind because yeah. I know like it's really hard to just say like, hey, I like I went to a, like if we're being honest, the probably you said about the '90s in the space. Some administrator went, saw it was cool, mm-hmm. just redid it without input, probably, <laughs> and just yeah. you know did it and said like, why why is this not working the way it says in the book? Well, because you didn't do any of the pre work before. You just changed the space, but you didn't change the thinking. Right. So right. I think, I think that's a, that, that's a, that's a good point or that's a, you know, really kind of important point because it's easy to say it's the teacher's fault, but it's like, what, what did you do to prepare, you know, them to think different, right? Like it's cha- you want to change experience of the classroom, change experience with the teacher first. Right. So I, I think that's a, a important point. I got to ask this. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, do you guys ever like, I know you work together a lot. Do you ever like fight? Like, is this a thing? Do you ever like, <laughs> Is that an issue that ever happens or like, you know, you're like, you know what, we're just, we're going to close the door today. Like, that's it. (laughs) (laughs) I, you know, I, when you were talking about like, how do you make this successful? Mm -hmm. There was one word that came to mind and that, that word was like trust. Right. Um, And I just read somewhere um, that like trust is so necessary for any type of feedback. And, you know, I think it was written as um, teachers giving feedback to students. The, The students need to be able to trust their teacher because Without trust, when you're giving feedback and it's positive, it's just flattery. It's right. not like a joke. It's not helpful at all. And if it's negative, then it's just criticism. But if you have a relationship where you know there's trust built into it, then then even if you have to say something like this isn't working or you know they're not going to take it critically. Um, so I don't remember any like fights. I remember. Um, oh, I, I hope Zach like, got, has one because like I remember. <laughs> Zach gets tired, you know, right. he, he, he's, he kind of, you know, I would be like, all right, let's do this. And then, but we had to take breaks. Right. So that was the only thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. No, there were no like, like <laughs> dramatic fights or table flipping right. or anything right. like that. Um, no table flipping. And it, I, I remember fr- like, not with each other, but with the idea, like when it first started, you know, it sounds like this cool idea. And those first couple of days were like, big time struggle yeah, and right. it was constant iterations until we got into the groove of thing uh into the groove of things kinda, but it's not not to say that it was something that was a massive success right away yeah we definitely um, had to push push past the uncomfortable mm-hmm. growing pains and and it you know it, it lasted probably twice as long as an ordinary classroom would just because there were twice as many people in it so. yeah and that and like that, that is learning that's 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 what 100%. we should be doing right and i think when we go through education and it's sometimes we, we go through that process where something's really hard and then we give up because we can, it's easily to fall back into what we used to do. Uh, but then you would never be okay with a kid doing that. Like you would never have a kid struggle in math and you say, you know what? Give up. <laughs> like just, just pack. You're yeah. not going to, you're not going to yeah. use that anyway. So like you would, you'd say like, Hey, this is part of the struggle. You kind of got to work through it. And that's, that's part of the process. Uh, of learning what you're doing. Uh, I, I want to ask you this too. Uh, you're both at, at a conference right now, totally skipping, right? <laughs> right. No. That's right. So I know you're, I, are you, are you presenting there? Are you presenting? Uh, we, we presented this morning, um, but the conference is over. We're just hanging out. Yeah. In right. The art room. That's right. <laughs> okay. So what, what, did, what did you present on? Um, so it was really, it was a, it's been a great conference. It's been hosted by uh, the University Liggett School in Gross right. Point. And it's about, uh, it's been about inquiry and how to, how to grow um, cultures of thinking. And uh, we were asked to present a, like a, like a Ignite style um, mm-hmm. short talk. Yeah. And then kind of like go into a, like a, a different thinking routine and like kind of help other teachers and administrators um, through that process. Uh, so our, our session was titled art as activism. Okay. And, uh, I got to tell a personal story about, um, all of the work that uh, my family has done in the last uh, year, year and a half, um, you know, unpacking our own privilege and bias, um, in the aftermath of, um, George Floyd's murder. Um, but specifically about, um, the response that my son has been able to, um, to have, in um, raising money for different causes and um, using his passions, connecting mm-hmm. his passions to making um, an impact 
uh, for social justice. He's um, grown plants. We've we've sold plants mm -hmm. out of our front yard, like a lemonade stand. Um, we've um, opened a a mini bakery, a vegan bakery, uh, selling baked goods to our friends and neighbors, and most recently um, have designed these art poles um, to um, create a more open and welcoming community in our own neighborhood. Uh, and then taking all that money and donating them to causes like um, Campaign Zero, uh, originally the George Floyd Memorial Fund, and now we're looking at um, uh, the color of change and uh, the Trevor Project and things like that. So. And, and and Zach, you you presented as well. This, that, were you presenting yeah, so on this topic we, together? Yeah. Yeah, we led teachers through um, the making meaning thinking routine from Ron Richard's work, yeah. um, creating a shared definition of what the word activism means. So it was using that spark talk to um, give some background knowledge, use the thinking routine to create this um, in an effort to give give these teachers a thinking routine that they can take into their classroom next year to deepen the learning. Yeah, and my, my question my question ultimately is, is kind of modeled in your answers already is like when we go to conferences and, you know, obviously a lot of stuff that you're talking about is learning that you've done over the past year too, right? That's, you know, went into mm -hmm. your classroom and talked about this. How, like when you are participating in a conference or you're presenting at a conference, my question is how, like, how do your students know not what you end up knowing and doing, but what you're learning, if that makes sense. Right. So like the process, right. So sometimes you might go to something and you might be struggling with a concept that was shared or like, uh, Zach, we were talking earlier that, you know, you struggled with technology early on in your career, uh, and then I'm, you know, did like one year, day you just started using it and everyone's like, what's going on here? Like this guy hated <laughs> it for you. Like, how do we kind of show? And I think, uh, Ron Richard, his book is, isn't it making thinking visible or thinking visible? Yeah. And yeah. So like, so I totally lends into this, but like, how do you, when you attend a conference, when you like, you know, go through some of your own learning, how do you actually make that visible to students? So they don't see the end point, but they see the process. I try to just like, not even just in school or academic learning, but like try to be transparent with students. If we want students to be trying new things, we need, right. we can't be, we have to be doing that in our own lives. And my students maybe laughed at me a little bit about this, but at the end of this school year, uh, I decided that I needed to start like doing yoga. So I went to a few yoga right. classes and like the next morning during our morning meeting was telling them like, I got called out by the instructor because right. I was the worst one in this class. Like it's you were, okay. You were talking and, the whole time, maybe. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but just like being open yeah. with students and like we can expect students to do things that we're not going to be doing as well. Yeah. And I'll share two two quick examples. Usually, usually we're presenting ab about like um, topics that we talk about in our book. Mm -hmm. And um, those are all anecdotes and stories from our from our classrooms. So mm -hmm. our students like during the year, yeah. they know. They knew about the, about the book that we were writing. They knew about the editing process. They knew that we were taking it through the you know revisions, and I showed you know showed them the cover and the, how we had different iterations of the design. And um, they knew that they were the subject though, and we actually dedicated uh, our book to all of the students that we've had. Um, and because we're taking pictures of them, you know, sharing them, sharing it out, and then talking about it. And when we're not talking about it, um, one thing that I've, I've just started doing in the, mm -hmm. in the last couple of years is having my students be the ones presenting. So right. the students are actually the ones to talk about their own learning journey at conferences like this. Um, two years ago, um, not, tw yeah, 2019, I had four of my former students uh, do what you did for our district and give the opening keynote uh, address to our school district. That's awesome. So they got up on, on stage and shared about um, what it was that made their learning uh, stick. And I, I want Zach to share one more story about the process of learning because um, he had a, an awesome idea to start a podcast with his classroom. And at the time he had no idea how to do it. And so that was a learning experience. Do you wanna share? Yeah. Share that? Um, so just going through a new process with them and being transparent in the fact that like, I have this idea, um, I, I actually did not tell them the idea of we're going to start a podcast. I kind of led them to mm. the idea of listening through podcasts and then they wanted to start one. So we started a class podcast in, uh, I think 2018 it's, we've gone on our third, uh, school year with it, but instead of me 
just like trying to figure everything out. I invited uh, Kelly Croy, host of the Wired Educator podcast, to yep. Skype in with our classroom, and he taught my my students and myself um, all about everything he had learned in his six seven years of being a podcaster. Um, so just like being along for the learning journey with the students and not always having to be the number one know-it-all expert in the classroom. Right. That's awesome. And, and uh, Kelly, I've been on Kelly's podcast, so that, that would be a pretty uh, awesome, awesome deal. I, I'm going to just for anyone who's organizing a school event, uh, I'm going to just talk about something that you kind of shared real quick. The one of the things that I've noticed, so I, you know, I'm at doing keynotes for opening day events and school districts all the time. And teachers are hard to get quiet when you're, you know, people are about to speak, right? Like if we're yeah. being totally honest, right? And I remember, uh, and I've seen superintendents and it's like the worst thing is when the superintendent, when we got to go, shh, or they put their hand up, like that's the worst, right? Like the elementary kid thing. <laughs> like, oh, this is, this is not good, right? And then it kind of just even gets a little bit louder. It's like, I'm not being quiet because you put your hand up, right? So, so one time I was at, um, I was at a school district in Lethbridge, Alberta. And I, you know, I started speaking and I'd probably done, you know, 50 events at that point. And they had a grade two kid come up and take the mic to start the day. Silence immediately. The kid didn't even talk, <laughs> right? As soon as the kid put the mic and you can hear the little mic noises and stuff like that. Because who yeah. wants to interrupt a seven-year-old? You know, especially if you're a teacher. <laughs> like, even if you did, people were like, what are you doing, right? Like, how dare you do this to this child? So if you are, if you are ever having, for people that maybe organize events for their school district, it, it, it is so valuable to have kids as part of that, because I think it reminds everyone why we're there in the first place. Right. And I, like, I, I have, uh, I've often had students introdu introduce me, like people will say like, who, like, who would you like, Hey, we have some kids. Are you okay? Then I'm like, please, that'd be the best. Right. And then yeah. talk about them. And, and I've actually asked, like, I've actually, I remember this one time I went to, um, I remember going to a school district and students introduced me and it was like all sweet and nice. Right. And then I walk up to the stage and they're like leaving. I'm like, where are you going? Do you not want to hear what I'm saying? Like, and they're like, nah. And I, I actually said to them, like, I would love for you to stay. I want to, I want to hear what you think about what I'm saying. And if you don't like it, tell me, cause I'm here to help you. And so tell me if I'm on track. And they said, nah, we're good. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I, I'll, how about this? If, if you stay and it sucks, I'll take you all to the Dairy Queen. And I'll, I'll take you all out for lunch. And if, if you hate it, you got to be honest, then I'll take you out to Dairy Queen. And they're like, okay, we'll stay. And then they stayed. And, I, and they, are, they are like, wow, I love that. That was awesome. And I, I talked to them. Um, and it was really interesting. They said something to me that I'll never forget. Well, I kind of forget how they said it, but I remember the, the reaction. They said, um, we were sitting at lunch and I was like getting their feedback. And they said, if the teachers are here on this day and they're listening to you, how come we don't see these things in our, in our classroom? And it was like a really kind of like eye opening thing. And I've told that story several times because, um, this is why I asked you the question, like how do kids know that we're learning stuff to be better? Like, you know, like, do we just go through the motions of a PD day because, you know, we have to do it or do, do we actually, cause if it doesn't actually impact kids in the classroom, it's a waste of time in my opinion. Right. So yeah. th that was, that was a, uh, that was a really powerful thing. And so I'm glad your district uh, honored that. I I'm going to ask you this question while I have you both here, because I did keynote in your school district. What, what did you take away from that day? I'm curious of like, if you remember anything that happened that day? Uh, you better got something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It was. Because I, I hope I hope something. I don't want to edit this out. <laughs> it was amazing, and um, we actually mentioned it. That's right. Uh, thank that, you. That we <laughs> shout out to Se Jared self Jared. shout out. <laughs> Love it. That um, like you know that we heard from you in the small group first, mm -hmm. and then it was the big keynote on stage at, at our high school. And, um, those, be, you know, between those two days, like it set the stage. That was the, that was the, um, the week before we started this co-teaching adventure. Right. So it's like, we went into it like so energized and so, um, like full of optimism about what it could be and what it could mean for students. Uh, so yeah, for me, it was definitely impactful and having my kids up on stage, like, you know, a couple years mm -hmm. later, um, like, I think that's the proudest moment of my awesome. teaching career. 
Um, and it's on YouTube. Maybe we'll put the link sure. in the show notes um, because they did a great job and uh, still friends with their family. So that's awesome. Is that, you, Zach, you, yeah. were you there? Yeah. Um, were you no. there? Or you just did I, I, did I, I wake you up? Did I wake you up? Did I wake you up that day? You're like Canadian <laughs> no, accent. Keep saying it was, it, it was fantastic. Um, but what I I always think of your quote: "The change is the opportunity to do something yeah. amazing." Um, kind of always keep that at the forefront of my mind because all of us get in that routine and that yeah. rut of like, well, this is the way I always did it. And like, you know, it, we, we pride ourselves on being innovative educators and pushing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it takes like practice and constant thought yeah. of doing that. It's so easy to fall back in our way. So it was just, I remember it being a very energizing day. Um, like Grayson said, right, like literally the week <laughs> before kids walked into our giant experiment, that's uh, awesome. Classroom. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was a, it was great time. We actually, we actually named our, you know, sometimes kids or teachers have like the second grade busy bees or, or, you know, yeah. the starfish or whatever. We changed our name to be the fourth grade innovators. And the fourth grade today, we are still the fourth grade. Innovators. Really? And there you go. so, yeah, thinking about that. that, like when kids come back uh, and visit us or say right. something, I always ask, you know, what, what do you remember? Basically what you just asked us. I always ask, what do you remember from fourth right. grade? Uh, you know, no kid ever says like uh, unit seven math tests. You right. know, I got the fourth question wrong. But what they talk about is like they talk about the wise words quotes we do in the morning or I they will name the innovator and know that these kids will say years later that, you know, to think like an innovator, you got to do think about something new and differently. It's I either love a that. new way of doing something or a different way. I love so that. that definition that you wrote in your book and said about innovator is as lived on in our fourth grade i think this is a fourth fourth year now so basically that's the closest i'm ever going to get to a uh, school being named after me <laughs> you have a classroom yeah, okay i'll take all it the, all the whole all the fourth three grade. three yeah, fourth three, grade three, three, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll take it okay so <laughs> i and i i just wanted i wanted to see if you remember that too and i appreciate your kind words and yeah. it, was, it was awesome i remember your 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 district actually i remember like we were in like a, I think it was like, I didn't, was it the day before? It was like a couple months before, was it not? And then I, I can't, like, I remember work and then coming back later. Was that right or no? It, that could have been like sometime over the summer. Yeah. 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 Um, two things I remember from the small group. One was that we like the, I think the tech chair role in our district was brand new. And you're like, what's a tech chair? What does that even mean? Like, <laughs> And it got us to think about the role differently. Right. right. And then uh, the other thing was you um, challenged, you know, in a very kind way, uh, <laughs> our district to consider opening YouTube to students. And it has since opened, you know, they've uh, since allowed students to access YouTube. So oh. that was a big change. Yeah. <laughs> kid, kid shout out to George. <laughs> they probably they, Okay, so I'll take it. I'll take it. So yeah, no, it's all. And I, I, I've worked in Michigan several times, and it's just wonderful. It's, it's kind of like let's be honest. It's basically Canada. You're, you're actually. Yeah, I, I take that. Right. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's actually, uh, Michigan is north of Canada. Is yeah. actually, uh, it's like that's the northernmost country of Canada. Is, or sorry, that's the first country north of Canada, the United States, right? Based on the geography. Yes. Right. Yep. That's like a little trick question someone gave me one time. Yeah. All right. So I got to ask you um, about your book, The Expert Effect. Uh, so you wrote this together, right? Yes. This, so do you, do you guys just like, like, do you hang out all the time? Like, is this what we're doing? <laughs> were you like, you know, taking turds while one, you know, like, hey, I'll, I'm going to teach this period. You, you get your, your edits done. So we, tell, we, tell we, us, we a little, yeah, tell us, a, tell us a little yeah. about, uh, tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, so uh, we did not write the book on contract time. We'll put that out there uh, <laughs> right now. But um, so Grace and I have been, the book is called The Expert Effect, a uh, three-part system to break down the walls of your classroom and connect your students to the world. And this is kind of an evolution over the past, I'd say, eight years of working together where mm -hmm. we did a lot of present uh, presenting together on, um, you know, we started with a lot of, it will really we started presenting on you know 25 apps to use with right. your new yeah. ipad and kind of you know then moved into like student training. voice and um realized we were doing technology training and then more theory and kind of over the course of doing this we got to the part the point of kind of distilling what we were saying down to three things of how do we get our students to learn from outside experts mm -hmm. how do we get our students to become experts through project-based learning right. 
And then how do we take the student's work and not just have it live and then die inside of our classrooms, but how do we get it out to authentic audiences and how can it be published on the internet or right. how can it be a classroom podcast or how can it be a video that their families can watch and um, where students are teaching there. as experts. So yeah, they learn from become and then teach as experts to, to somebody outside the classroom. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a video I share and I don't remember if I shared it when I was with you all, um, but it's a school in Brazil that is working with their kids. They're learning uh, English and they connect the re uh, retirement home in Chicago to the school in Brazil. And so these kids are, uh, you know, like middle school, high school age talking to seniors at a retirement home in Chicago. And I say like, watch the impact the adults have on the kids, but also watch the impact the kids have on the adults. And the, the main points I make from that video is it is like amazing time that we live in that we can bring experts into our classroom, but we have to focus on sharing our expertise with the world. And I think a lot of times people think I'm talking specifically about teachers and I am in some capacity, but it's more, also focusing on how do we get students sharing this stuff? Because if you have kids who are teaching stuff to the entire world, they're gonna they're gonna do way better, right? Like like what's mm -hmm. an example yeah. of something you've done in your classroom that you know signif like is an example of you know something maybe you talk about in the book, but you know kind of that concept that you're sharing. Yeah, having a, um, a a huge part of my classroom and has always been kind of a core principle for me as a teacher is. Um, starting the day on a positive note and doing a morning meeting and talking about the core principles of having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset or perseverance. Um, so doing those things. And when we first started our podcast, it was um, the mission was to inspire and spread positive messages around the world. So getting kids to um, take those messages, have to write their own scripts, kind of formulate their own. A lot of times, you know, fourth graders and nine-year-olds, they love to write little skits that mm -hmm. proves their point um, and perform them on the podcast. So getting them to take that learning and, you know, it could be a journal prompt, but if it's a one, they're going to write one sentence, shut the journal, no one's going to look at it. Right. When we look at the podcast and you can see that in the first 24 hours, it was viewed in 14 different countries around the world. Like that makes it real for mm -hmm. them. Um, and it also kind of taps into that idea when we go around on the first day of school like oh what do you want to be when you grow up it's no longer doctor teacher firefighter lawyer right. it's youtuber twitch streamer right so like instead of fighting against that mm -hmm. why not harness it and right. let them have a platform that's safe that we we are helping them um cultivate and build um within our school system so i think that's part of it so, yeah, and another example I'll just share really quick is um, another time when we had to do a lot of learning ourselves, um, and that was when we were invited to go to Chicago uh, to one of Apple's uh, like corporate headquarters, yeah. and we learned about um, some some of the coding apps that they were offering, and uh, you know they had this campaign everyone can code, and so we had I I'm not a computer scientist I don't right. I don't know anything but um, you know they say that computer coding or you know knowing that as a language or knowing that as a as a way to convey meaning uh, is one of the most important skills that people will need in the future so bringing this back we like after we learned from experts in Chicago then we got to help our students learn a little bit of basic coding with a couple of different apps on their iPads and then um, we said all right so now we're going to think about a problem that you that you can identify in the world and design an app, so taking them through like kind of the design thinking process, uh, design an app that would help to solve that problem. And they made um, basically these app prototypes. Mm. And then uh, we had a showcase day where, uh, you know, we took over the cafeteria and we invited our school board members, we invited our central office team, we invited um, some of the uh, computer teachers from the high school and middle school to come and check out like their ideas. And their app ideas were amazing. Um, but giving them that audience, giving them, uh, you know, saying like, this is the, the showcase date. So you, you, mm -hmm. all of the work that you're doing is going to be shared with the world on this at this time. It made it real. It wasn't just for the teacher as the, as the only audience member. And it, the motivation was incredible. And like I said, the, the results that we got were, were just awesome. It was also that one was also an authentic task where right. it was like so, create an app to solve a real world problem. So it, it had all of those elements built into it. So I'm gonna, this is the last question I'm going to ask you. Ask you. Well, I got two more. This one's the last education <laughs> question I'm going to ask. So, Zach, when we were talking earlier, 
you basically said like you didn't even use technology, right? And now mm-hmm. you're doing all yep. this incredible stuff, kids publishing. And I don't think we're at a point anymore. We know with basically the last year, like I'd be yes. surprised if every teacher wasn't, didn't use zoom at least. But mm-hmm. using using Zoom to like connect with your students is much different than actually getting your kids to create stuff, share it with the world, right? So like, yeah, they might have used technology, but have they actually like a lot of times? You even think about something as simple as the smart boards, right? Uh, a lot of people, you have two administrators. One goes in the classroom and sees a teacher using a smart board and like tapping stuff and you know uh, doing the little aligning thing, and go, wow, this teacher is great because that administrator has never used technology. But then the sa- another administrator walked in and said, well, you didn't get the kids to do anything. Like, what are the kids doing with technology? That's where you're actually going to see the effectiveness. So um, talking about the use of technology in a way uh, where kids are creating, kids are making, you two are obviously, you know, further down the road, you've literally written a book on the topic. I, what, do I, what, what about the, the educator that's listening right now? who maybe is just getting started. Cause like a lot of times it's not just even educators listening to this that don't start, but maybe uh, other people that are working with educators that don't know how to help a teacher get started because like, I, and, and it's not a disparaging way because let's be honest, I was the same way. I hated technology. Y- y- y'all pushed it away too, yeah. but we just, you know, I was ahead of you guys uh, in some, in, and you're ahead of other people. So I never looked down on that because there's tons of people that were ahead of me. Right. So how do we help that person that's freaked out about this, you know, new to it? Like what, what would be your, your, like, here's my, here's a first step of something to try. So one thing I would, it starts with a mindset and, you know, we talk about having a classroom podcast that goes out and I would never tell Mm -hmm. someone that you need to have a classroom podcast. That's the best way to do things. But um, what you said is about creating. So what's, what's one project you can take throughout the school year. You have to know your curriculum well where is a project that you can take where students can create something? And maybe this is a project where they're already creating like uh, a poster or something like that. And how can you make, give them an op- the options of creating? So instead of locking students in where you finish a project and every single project is a video or every single project is a keynote presentation, um, what I would say is give students choice and set the parameters of Here's the goal of your project. We want to show X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. How you show X, Y, and Z is up to you. And give them, you know, we're we're one-to-one with iPad, so more familiar with those Mm -hmm. tools, but like Keynote, iMovie, or Apple Clips, like using the basic tools that are there um, to start that way. And starting small with one thing in particular as opposed to trying to open it all up and embed technology into everything you do. Yeah, if you took our book and boiled it down to like the three most basic questions, it's who can we get our students to learn from? What can they create? And that's what Zach was talking about. Like, you know, we just learned from uh, Trevor McKenzie at our at our mm-hmm. conference. He loves to ask the question, uh, if you could show me, you know, what you know in any way, what how would you show me what you know right. or what you've learned? And um, so, yeah, what can they make? And then the third question, who can they share it to who can they talk teach it to and so you know even an app as simple as the the camera app on your ipad or or Mm -hmm. uh you know a record like using flipgrid to record a video like that's a simple entry point um that can just be uh one way to document their learning or one way to document what they've what they've come away from Um, and so that's a really simple step so uh, i'm sure a lot of people listening to this know the terms assessment of learning assessment for learning and they talk about those. I've actually, um, third concept I've talked about is the notion of assessment as learning and saying like, hey, um, you know, a kid might not know how to make a YouTube video and that's not necessarily your job to teach it. You have this curriculum, but if the kid's interested in it, say like, figure it out, like do that yourself. Like, and a lot of kids will do that and seeing that as part of the process. And then I've been asked, well, how do you mark the YouTube video? And you guys are hitting the nail on the head. I'm like, you don't want, you don't mark the video. You mark the kids on, you assess the kids understanding of the concept that you're supposed to teach, but they're learning all these other skills through that process. Right? So that, that is the, the notion of assessment as uh, learning. All right. This is the last question. And so anyone that's listening, check out expert effect. I know you summarized it, but I'm sure there's more to it. It's not just those three things, right? You, you go a little bit deeper, yeah. but check it out uh, on Amazon uh, in the link below. All right. So are you, are you, are you Detroit, huge sports city, right? 
Oh yeah. So we're gonna do. We're gonna. I, I gotta know this. Are you big sports fans or no? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. when we were in the classroom together, like if we had kids that were like into sports, like Zach was their go-to. They gravitated towards him. If you had like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, <laughs> Star Wars, they came to me. So okay. It's okay. Okay. So Zach, I'm gonna do this with you then. Okay. So I'm gonna see. Like yeah. we're gonna have like basically, you gotta pick which one's your favorite until we figure out who is the champ. Okay. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Lions or tigers? Lions. Okay. Lions or Pistons? Lions. Uh oh. We're going to find out how Canadian you are. Lions <laughs> or Red Wings? Red Wings. Really? You picked the Red Wings. Yeah. All right. Right. I've, Too I've bad because I've, I've played hockey since I was seven years old. All right. I grew up with the, those 90s Red Wings. That's, right. that's you, my jam. Right you just there. blew your chance to be on Detroit Lions TikTok, which is like the best TikTok for a football team ever. So shout out Red Wings. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So Zach, or sorry, Grayson, I don't know anything about Harry Potter. So Harry Potter, <laughs> the Dumbledore, I don't know. I don't, I don't. Which house? Which is that, house? is that the same book? Yeah. Yeah. No, good job. Okay. Uh, so, ooh, Harry Potter. Okay. Oh, Harry Potter wins. <laughs> that's, that's all I got. That's, I don't, I don't know those books. So I was, I was kind of see the movies but anyways hey it was such a pleasure to hang out with you guys and just uh and thank you for taking the time um i know you're at a conference i know it's over i know it's your summer break so totally debunking again over and over again the teachers don't work in summer right so thank you yep. so much for your time uh but people um anyone listening right now check out this book obviously this is from a place of experience and they're still teaching right now so um i, I wish you uh, i hope uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, take the rest of the summer off. And because you did this, you can take an, you can take an extra day. Just take it in lieu. Talk to your principal. So we, we gave her a shout Thank out. You. So, but thanks everyone for listening. Uh, Zach and Grayson, thanks for being on today. Thank you for having us, George. Right. Thank right. you so much. See you guys. Take care, everyone.